I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support too. That's where Ollie comes in with their delightful, hardworking gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here again. You're listening to the China History Podcast. I first want to express my deepest thanks to everyone who's been so kind to support this long-running family program. And those of you who recently subscribed to my Patreon and to CHP Premium, I appreciate your support and kind words. And I hope you enjoy the ad-free listening and other bonus material and early access to these CHP episodes weeks before they show up on this RSS feed. So if you'd like to assist me in my mission, please visit the website at teacup.media and click on support. There's all kinds of ways. Okay, more Guangzhou history again. We're in the Qing Dynasty. In the last three episodes, we looked at this city's history from about the Qin with the establishment of the Nanhai Commandery, one of the 36 the first emperor called for to help manage his new empire. In these 17, 18th centuries of Guangzhou history we looked at so far, in my utterly worthless opinion, as far as popular Chinese history goes, where Guangzhou is concerned at least, eh, it sort of takes a back seat to what we're going to look at from here on out. As far as China's imperial history, going back to 221 BC, it's the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1912, that is closest to us in our time and is therefore most familiar and more accessible thanks to all the surviving historical documents, books, and archival images from Chinese and foreign sources. Between the arrival of the Portuguese in the early 1500s and the founding of the PRC, there was plenty else happening in Guangzhou besides the history of foreign trade and all the wars, unequal treaties, uprisings, and revolution. To all seafaring traders from China's south and west, Guangzhou had always served as the front door. That's where the Pearl River emptied out into the South China Sea. It was on China's coast. That's just how it all panned out. This part of China, it had no choice. All because of the way the rivers flowed, this city was destined to be what it became. And despite occasional setbacks, all the bounty and traded luxuries and commodities transported between the Mediterranean and the South China Sea were ultimately sold in Guangzhou, it was a peaceful trade, and just as the demand for China's silk and porcelain was enormous, so was China's demand for the spices, hardwoods, and other luxuries brought to China's front door from near and from afar. And after so many centuries of trial and error and lessons learned, the executions, prohibitions, and fortunes made and lost, everyone on both sides, the Chinese side and with the foreign traders, they put a pretty good trade system in place where, well, perhaps no one was ever fully satisfied, but everyone was making money. And every captain or supercargo of every vessel that sailed up the Pearl River estuary to unload their cargo at the port of Guangzhou, they were all well-versed in all the mutual exchanges of gifts, rituals, and all the civilities that had to be uttered and paid attention to. Besides the nitty-gritty of buying and selling, now, there was a degree of theater as well that had to be dealt with. And foreigners who came to China to trade were always severely restricted, and there was no way to pull a fast one with the Chinese authorities. The rules were very rigid, and no one was allowed to walk around Guangzhou and enjoy the sights. From the very beginning, no matter what they thought of them, the attitude of the China authorities was pretty clear. They were all for trade, but it had to be carried out in a certain way. And because China was such a great and magnificent empire, everyone went along with the program. I mentioned the Fanfang of Guangzhou, where the foreigners resided inside the city. And there, were, there were exceptions, but all this import-export trade, as it had long been carried out for two millennia, took a huge hit as soon as Zhu Yuanzhang got comfortable on his throne in his palace in Nanjing. I mentioned last time he pretty much set the tone for the remainder of the Ming Dynasty as far as how welcome foreigners were made to feel. 
They had come to China for either the trade or for religion, and ruining it for everyone were pirates and smugglers. The age of exploration brought more than trade, diplomacy, colonization, and the spread of knowledge. It also brought piracy and thieving, and this blight on humanity engaged in their stock and trade, which depended heavily on coercion, killing, violence, and robbing. And so out of hand did this get. Emperors, beginning with the Ming founder, Zhu Yuanzhang, instituted these Haijin, or sea bands, that closed down the coastline to trade and allowed it to continue only in an extremely restrictive manner and in the style of the former tribute trade that everyone thought they had seen the last of. So maritime trade continued, but it was hardly carried out like it had been during the good old days of the Tang and the Song. It was during this time of restricted trade and mistrust that the Europeans started showing up. And tea wasn't even a traded commodity yet when the Portuguese came in 1513. Tea won't arrive in Europe until 1610, when it first appears in The Hague. And it won't be until the mid-1600s, perhaps beginning with Portugal's Catherine of Braganza's marriage to Charles II, that tea even started to become such a blockbuster hit. So when the Europeans started showing up in Guangzhou, trade in what was destined to become the most important commodity of all hadn't even begun yet. Macau was an imperial grant, wrote one historian of yore, to the vassals of Portugal for eminent services rendered by them to the Celestial Empire. The authorities in Guangzhou tightly managed the Portuguese in Macau. Whatever the written details were from the Jia Jing Emperor in 1557, in these earliest years, Portugal merely occupied Macau, and the Qing authorities were the ones who pulled the strings, so to speak. In the early decades of the 17th century, traders from other European nations began showing up, and they wanted the same deal the Portuguese had. But that was never to be. What the Portuguese got in Macau was never offered again to anyone else. And so lucrative was the China trade, the Portuguese had to fight off everyone from Europe trying to muscle in on their action. They had to beg the officials in Guangzhou to allow them to build fortifications on Macau and colluded with them to keep the Spanish and Dutch at bay. And as long as the Portuguese were willing to cough up the lost potential profits, the authorities in Guangzhou would refuse these entreaties to trade at their port by Portugal's enemies. In 1655, a Dutch mission went all the way to Beijing to appeal to the Xunzhi Emperor to allow them to trade. They didn't meet with any success, but in the 24th year of the Emperor Kangxi's reign in 1685, there was a burst of sunshine, and he legitimized foreign trade and gave the okay to open up a number of maritime customs stations at several major ports along the China coast. And of all the ports, it was in Guangzhou that most traders gravitated to, and for its efficiency in regulating the trade and dispersing a portion of the revenues to the imperial court, the city quickly established itself as the premier port in China. It was hands down the port of choice for many foreign traders. By late in Kangxi's reign, there were already 40 Chinese trading firms handling all this foreign commerce down there. And what Kangxi permitted in 1685 began to tighten up under his successor. The Yongzheng Emperor, in 1725, signed off on the creation of the Kohong. And when the trading season came to an end, foreigners all had to vacate Guangzhou. At first, they tried to reside temporarily in Macau, but that wasn't allowed either. Because of their shared Catholic faith, the Portuguese made exceptions for their Spanish rivals. But it's right about here, during Yongzheng's reign, where the problem that would one day lead to war started to become institutionalized. Plain and simple, for reasons mostly concerning the suspicions the Manchu rulers had of the foreign traders, the Qing court cast a wary eye on them. As soon as they began to understand who they were and from where they had come, they saw them as a potential danger to their Qing dynasty. In 1746, the government seat for the sister provinces of Guangdong and Guangxi, or Liangguang, was established in Guangzhou, 
Demand for Chinese goods and foreign markets never let up. And this is what brought the traders to Guangzhou, despite the stumbling blocks and prohibitions and restrictions. By the 1760s, plying these waters in the South China Sea, besides the usual suspects from all over Asia, were Portuguese, Dutch, Danish, Swedish, English, and Spanish vessels. And by 1757, thanks to the Qianlong Emperor's edict, all trade was strictly limited to Guangzhou, and that's where the foreigners set up their factories and resigned themselves to do their China business. And what emerged became known as the Yi Kotongshang, or Canton System. And did these European merchants ever come to hate this system? By the mid-18th century, they were all chafing at the regulations. The Europeans called Guangzhou Canton because of the Portuguese pronunciation. They got naming rights in the West because they were the first to arrive. And they referred to the place as Canton, which the English picked up on and adopted as their name for the city. And all the way up to modern times, that was the name of the city for many non-Chinese speakers. The province Guangdong is also sometimes referred to as Canton Province, and its inhabitants as Cantonese. By the 18th century, tea, once referred to as the China drink, had become such a popular commodity, it turbocharged the already red-hot foreign trade at Canton. And just as it is today, with so many categories of items, China was the only place you could get tea, porcelain ware, and silk. Of course, silk by then was made in many places, but China silk was still highly sought after. Well, the series of events concerning the Opium Wars have been told and retold in past CHP episodes, so I'm going to try and focus mostly on how the city of Guangzhou fared during this period in Chinese history that's not only reviled by patriotic Chinese, but by many others as well. These 19th century events in particular represented imperialism at its worst. Although the Opium Wars played out in various locations, including Beijing and Tianjin up in the north, as well as Ningbo, Zhoushan, Xiamen, and Nanjing, for the most part, this conflict played out in and around Guangzhou in the Pearl River estuary. On the face of it, the foreign traders, mostly the British, sought free and open trade throughout China without having to jump through all these hoops and having to deal with all these restrictions that made the trade more expensive, less efficient, and in a nutshell, damn near difficult to carry out. The Manchu rulers and Chinese nationals, and for good reason too, I guess you could say, going back to the incidents with Simo de Andrade in 1521, weren't so sure they wanted these guys freely roaming around their fine city. The merchants in Guangzhou were all in favor of doing business with them. It was a very profitable enterprise, and the demand for the big three Chinese commodities seemed to be insatiable. But these Kohong merchants were beholden to the Guangzhou authorities, who were beholden to the emperor up in Beijing. And from 1735 to 1796, this was the Qianlong Emperor. Say what you want to say about him. All his fault. He didn't see what was coming. He should have been more accommodating to the British. But his decision was to keep these barbarians at bay to the greatest extent possible, but still allow for trade, which, like it or not, provided a nice stream of revenue to the imperial treasury. Qianlong's concerns and the reason behind the Canton system were simple. Firstly, he wanted to keep these foreigners as far from Beijing as possible. Guangzhou was the perfect place. As China ports went, it was as far from the capital as you can get. He wanted the trade strictly regulated to both maximize the income generated from it, but also tightly controlled so that it didn't get out of hand and be on the control of the officials sent to regulate it. What the emperor signed off on in 1745 was a system where each vessel that registered to trade at Guangzhou was assigned one of several Kohong merchants who would act as their exclusive agent to dispose of their cargo and arrange for the purchases of tea, silk, porcelain, and other commodities. And one could say the imperial treasury got eh, a little too greedy and always wanted more. And this conflicted with all those who comprised the hardware, so to speak, of the Canton system. The whole system quickly became corrupted and 
cutthroat, which in turn caused further anger and distress to those trying to do an honest business. But nobody argued with the Qianlong Emperor. He was one of the longest reigning and most consequential of all emperors, and he was at the peak of his powers when all this was happening. He relied on the Hapo, or Hu Bu, and the governor of the province to keep everything on an even keel. And where trade at Guangzhou was concerned, those two were gods. And one of the unintended consequences of the Canton system was that piracy and smuggling had a great leap forward during the 18th century and into the 19th. And if you follow the news, it's still around today, though not as bad. They were a pestilence in their day. Everybody involved in trade and who lived along the coastlines of China had to put up with them. But as long as trade remained so restrictive and limited to the port of Guangzhou only, it was the best of both worlds for this scourge. November 24th, 1784, the Lady Hughes incident went down near Guangzhou. A British vessel saluted an arriving Danish ship by firing their cannon in the time-honored tradition. A couple Chinese in harm's way were killed. Chinese demanded justice. The British said it was an accident, and everything went south from there. It was all a tempest in a teapot, a small matter. Faced with dire consequences for their trade at Guangzhou, the British handed over the unfortunate soul who fired the shot on the captain's orders, and he was promptly executed by the Chinese authorities. But the whole thing left a bad taste in the mouths of many who, moving forward, harbored all kinds of dark thoughts about this whole thing. And the extraterritoriality that was stitched into all the future unequal treaties that would start dropping one after the other beginning in 1842, all demanded this. And it's probably from this Lady Hughes incident that it all began. In what was already not a good situation, this made matters worse. And British demands to carry out trade at more ports than Guangzhou were getting nowhere. By the 19th century, tea had become such a huge business, traders were clamoring to be able to call on ports in Fujian, where the main tea-growing districts were. Well, I won't repeat all the gory details of the McCartney mission, August to October 1793. This could have gone either way. There's no telling how good or bad the history might have been written if the 82-year-old Qianlong Emperor took a chance on giving the British some or all of what they asked for. George Lord Viscount McCartney walked away empty-handed. 1813, Lord Amherst, nothing. Lord Napier, 1834, same thing. Things kept getting worse, not better. In 1833, following the St. Helena Act, the British East India Company lost its monopoly on trade with China and the Far East. Now, anyone could throw their hat in the ring. It was a whole new era in China trade with the European nations. Britannia was feeling invincible at that time. And everyone was getting tired of adhering to these rituals and arcane customs and perceived disrespect and scorn. When foreign steamships started showing up in China in 1835, some in the government saw this as a very bad sign. There were enough hard feelings, harsh words, and bad blood that had accumulated since Qianlong demanded the implementation of the Canton system in 1757. And under these conditions, it's safe to use the old cliché that the two sides were on a collision course. And this head-on collision happened right in Guangzhou. Imperial Commissioner Lin Zexu was sent down there in early 1839 on the emperor's orders to deal with the matter of opium. The opium business and all its potential was first recognized by the Portuguese, and they were the first ones to engage in its trade with China upon their arrival in the early 16th century. But the Portuguese were all small-time traders in opium. The Yongzheng Emperor, he tried to outlaw the sale and use of opium in 729, but eh, he didn't have any better luck than the DEA did with America's war on drugs. So despite the bans, the trade in opium never let up all these years. You know the story. The British East India Company cultivated and manufactured the opium and 
sold it to private country ships who sailed the cargo to Guangzhou, and in this way the EIC kept their involvement in the trade at arm's length and could point to their fig leaf and claim they weren't party to these transactions. Well, Lin Zexu really kicked the hornet's nest when he arrived in Guangzhou and ordered foreign traders to surrender their opium stocks. Captain Charles Elliott was in charge, representing all the vested interests in the company back in the home country, and Elliott's reputation for despising the opium trade in all its forms was well known, and he did the right thing and had the traders hand over their opium to the Chinese authorities who famously destroyed it all at Hulman on June 25, 1839. Elliot demanded compensation for the confiscated drugs, but Lin Zexu rightly refused, as would the DEA, I suppose, if El Chapo demanded the same thing for his cocaine seizures. Elliot made the captain of every vessel take out a bond that guaranteed henceforth they were not carrying any opium on board. And for the time being, the British decided to go along with Lin Zexu's demands. And the black hands behind the First Opium War, Lord Palmerston, Henry Bodinger, William Jardine, James Matheson, and all those other, well, whatever you want to call them, who probably had no regard for what their actions might lead to for posterity, they got what they wanted. They got their Opium War. Again, I'm not going to repeat the whole history of the Opium War. Let's just look at the main events that went down in and around Guangzhou. You can see it was mostly fought in Guangzhou and amidst all the many islands scattered throughout the Pearl River estuary. Let's go battle by battle. The first battle of Chuan Bi, November 3rd, 1839, was the icebreaker. It occurred not too far from where Lin Zexu burned all the opium four months prior. This was only a minor skirmish and not so important and only involved a foreign vessel trying to outrun Elliot's blockade to prevent any possible opium sales. But four Chinese vessels were sunk, and this was only the beginning. Elliot led his boats away from Guangzhou and laid anchor in Causeway Bay in Hong Kong. And after what had just happened, he knew the Chinese were going to respond in some way. In the meantime, Henry John Temple, 3rd Viscount Palmerston, back in London, was banging his battle drums and wasn't leaving any wiggle room for anyone to avoid a military confrontation. And so, in the summer of 1840, it all began. From the Yongzheng Emperor's decree outlawing the trade in opium in 1729 to this moment, 111 years, Chinese importers of the drug and foreign exporters, led by the British, of course, had thumbed their nose at the imperial court. As long as consumer demand remained strong, neither the buyer nor the seller was going to get out of the business. The first major battles of the war happened up north in Zhoushan, off the coast of Ningbo. Palmerston had his eye on this place and was aiming to take it and plant the Union Jack in Dinghai. He was counting on Zhoushan to become a British possession in perpetuity from which to engage in the China trade. The Manchu official Qi Shan had been dispatched to Guangzhou to replace Lin Zexu, who failed in the emperor's most basic demand of keeping the British away from the capital. Part of the British fleet sailed all the way up to the Yellow Sea, and the other part went south to Guangzhou. Qi Shan and Charles Elliot removed themselves to Guangzhou to sort this whole thing out and find a solution. And for the remainder of 1840 and into 1841, there would be a number of battles, followed by truces, and far away from all the action up in Beijing, Emperor Dao Guang was apprised of what was going on in Guangzhou. The reports he was receiving were sanitized to make it appear as if the Qing forces had the British on the run. And after what happened to Lin Zexu, Qi Shan had to be careful to suppress any reports that might indicate eh, things weren't going according to plan. And by the hot summer of 1840, the British had assembled quite a show of naval force. It's hard to imagine the scene today in modern-day Guangzhou when you stand on the banks of the Pearl River, looking out on Xiamen Island. It looks so peaceful now. No, it was all-out war back then. Qing forces were amassing at all the coastal forts, from the Bogue, where Hunan is located, all the way into the city. And leading the Qing forces in Guangzhou 
were the Guangdong naval commander Guang Tianpei and the general Yang Fang. And each time the British blasted away and let loose with their unmatched firepower, it never ended well for the Chinese side. The Qing forts were not lacking for their own firepower. They had their own cannon technology acquired from the Portuguese. But that was 17th century technology. It was the 1800s now. And all the while, Elliot and Qi Shan went back and forth with discussions of truces and promises of withdrawing. And those on both sides who engaged in commerce amidst all this kept up their business. January 1841 came the Second Battle of Chuan Bi. British demands and Chinese unwillingness to accede to the demands led to this battle. Qing forces along the Bogue were blown away by British firepower. It wasn't a fair fight, and even with home field advantage and numerical superiority in soldiers, the Chinese military was no match for what was lined up against them. What followed was the Convention of Chuan Bi. It was signed to end the hostilities. But this peace treaty, which saw the cessation of Hong Kong to the British, infuriated both the Daoguang Emperor and Lord Palmerston, who was gunning for Zhou Shan and managing everything by remote control from London. By February, all along the riverfront in the city of Guangzhou, where traders had been coming and going since Qin Shi Huang's time, battle resumed. The Battle of the Bogue from February 23rd to 26th was more of the same. Brave Chinese resistance in the face of overwhelming British firepower. The next day was the Battle of First Bar. All the forts that guarded the route to Guangzhou had been captured or destroyed. And British warships now could come and go from the Bogue at Human all the way to within cannon range of the city walls. In March... The noose tightened around Guangzhou as all the key defense installations were taken. More and more troops were sent to Guangzhou to shore up Qing defenses. But this millennia-old city that was already a thriving metropolis long before England ever existed was now the site of one humiliating defeat after another. All Qing defenses were wiped out one after the other. Then on March 18, 1841, the British let loose on the city of Guangzhou. Attacks and counterattacks followed. Emperor Dao Guang was outraged at the reports he was getting. Qi Shan was replaced for his temerity at signing the Convention of Chuan Bi. He was dragged back to Beijing to personally face the emperor's wrath for giving in to the British demands. Now came the Manchu official Yi Shan's turn to assume the thankless role of chief negotiator. Now, mind you, even as all this was going on, trade was continuing. It suffered all kinds of disruptions, but amidst the shelling and guns firing and threats exchanged back and forth, you still had British and Chinese doing business on the riverbanks of the Pearl River. By May 1841, the city of Guangzhou was being bombarded, and the situation never looked more dire. But amidst this one-sided hammering of Chinese forces at the hands of the British, there was one bright spot that, although it was nothing more than a minor footnote in the Opium War, it's still heralded today as a show of brave resistance and defiance. At a place called Sanyuan Li in the Baiyun district in the north suburbs of Guangzhou, a six-minute drive from Yueshio Park, where the Guangdong Television Tower is, 20,000 locals banded together and fought back against British forces. The locals were inflamed over British looting of the city, and the spark that set things off was a rumor of the rape of some villager's wife. So the local people at San Yuan Li rose up and used their numerical superiority to surround the British forces. And before they could come in for the kill, the governor was warned that if any blood was spilled, British vessels would open up on Guangzhou and destroy the city. Now, ultimately, the crowd dispersed, and those British forces who were facing certain death were able to get away. Today, there's a San Yuan Li Revolutionary Martyrs Monument to mark the spot. This was a lone bright spot for the Chinese side amidst a whole series of defeats that saw Chinese numerical advantage fall to British superiority in weapons and firepower. By the end of May, Guangzhou was occupied by the British. 
Ishan arranged for a massive payoff to get the British to withdraw, which they did, sailing back to Hong Kong. Just as the Daoguang Emperor was dissatisfied with his negotiators, so it was with Charles Eliot, he was time and again lambasted for his conciliatory approach and was angrily replaced as superintendent by Henry Pottinger. Here's where the attention of the Opium War shifted from Guangzhou to the north of China. By end August 1841, Xiamen was taken by the British. But with the new elections in Britain, Palmerston lost his post and was replaced with less bellicose leadership. But the fight continued up the China coast, in Zhou Shan and Ningbo, the Qing forces had no better luck than in Guangzhou. Once the winter had passed, fighting resumed in the north in 1842. Shanghai was taken next, and the British forces turned their attention to Nanjing. They took Zhenjiang next on the Yangtze River and were able to close down access to the Grand Canal. And by August 1842, there was nothing more that could be done. And so, on August 29, 1842, the Treaty of Nanjing was signed and the First Opium War ended. In the end, the Chinese proved defenseless against the British Navy. The century of humiliation began right here, and though this term became a CCP propaganda favorite, anyone with a sense of China's long and often glorious history knew this was, without question, a massive humiliation for China. And it really was, only just starting. The city of Guangzhou has seen a lot of battles and massacres going back to the Han Dynasty and the time of Emperor Wu and the defeat of the Nanyue Kingdom in 111 BC. Much of the violence that visited Guangzhou over the centuries came from within, when one dynasty fell and another rose, when rebels rose up in revolt. But now the modern age had come to Guangzhou, and while events like the Red Turban Rebellion, Taiping Rebellion, and Nian Rebellion the Bunte, Hakka clan wars, while those tore the southern part of the country apart from the inside, the foreign powers got to spread their imperialist feathers like a peacock, and seeing the seemingly hopeless and degraded situation the country was in, feasted on China's riches for the next hundred years. For almost three years, Guangzhou had faced this on-again, off-again onslaught from the British Navy, British resolve to get what they wanted was too strong in the end. They wanted a permanent base from which to carry out their trade with China, and they wanted access to the whole country, not just Guangzhou. The Qianlong Emperor, dead for 43 years when the Treaty of Nanjing was signed, he was the one who had insisted on the Canton system. And for all these years, that was a bitter pill that all European traders had to deal with. Now began the treaty port era. Guangzhou's monopoly on trade was broken, and it went from being the most important coastal city in China for trade to being just one of five ports. And though it remained commercially important, all the social unrest of the 1850s and 60s caused Guangzhou's dominance to be replaced by the East Coast ports, mostly Shanghai, Ningbo, and Xiamen. After it had all come down to this, Chinese patriots started to appear one after the other, some who carried a gun and some who carried a writing brush. And Guangzhou's new role slowly began to emerge as a region where revolutionaries stared out over the wreckage of the city and planned for a new beginning. And next time we meet up, we'll finish up the 19th century and look at Guangzhou in modern times. There was a new dynamic now in the wake of the unequal treaties. Western influences in every shape and size began washing over Guangzhou. Because of the number of foreigners now present, soldiers, missionaries, bankers, investors, and traders, it lent a whole new atmosphere to this city. So that's all for next time. And until we reconvene in Part 5, this here is Laszlo Montgomery thanking each and every one of you for your kindness in listening. And please do consider coming back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.